Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. This question is all to do with consolidating a foreign subsidiary company. It's a question called MIMO. So I've set out a pro forma consolidated statement of financial position. Notice that I've slotted in additional lines for, first of all, goodwill as part of our non-current assets, and of course the non-current, sorry, the non-controlling interests as part of equity. This is sort of standard approach for all group questions. In addition, we've been asked to prepare an income statement for this question, so I've done that, and notice at the bottom of my income statement I've got some representation for the NCI, and my standard workings, group structure, net assets, the key dates, and as far as the group structure is concerned, we've got a fairly simple group structure in which the parent company, MIMO, has 75% of a random, the subsidiary. Therefore, of course, the NCI have 25%. We've got our regular net assets. Uh, the goodwill working slightly different. The way I set it out is I set it out in the functional currency of the subsidiary as well as the, the, the presentation currency of the parent at the two key dates, which are, of course, the acquisition date and SFP date. As far as the income statement is concerned, I'm going to prepare a standard income statement working with one column for the parent, one column for the subsidiary, an adjustment column in case we have any intragroup transactions, and a consolidation column too, where we add everything together. So we've set out, in effect, our key workings, and we're going to use these as the template to generate marks in the exam. It's really important we take a date-by-date, step-by-step and bit-by-bit -bit approach. So the first thing that we have to deal with is the cost of the investment from the Group SFP and we're told that that's 120 million crowns. You could at this stage, if you wish, uh, convert that into dollars, but I'm not, I'm not going to do that. Um, we're just picking that up from the first line of the question. And we are told, um, in respect of the subsidiary, that it has reserves at the date of acquisition. Now I'm going to use the local currency. I'm going to use crowns because that's the information that I've been given. So it's 80 million crowns at the acquisition date. What next? Well, we're going to start to work our way through the main elements of the group SFP. So we've got those of the parent. But you can't add apples and pears, so what we have to do, we need to convert all of the assets and liabilities of the subsidiary using the closing rate of exchange from crowns into dollars. Quick whiz out of the calculator, and if we do that, it works out as 65 point, sorry, $69.5 million. Next, we've got a loan. It's an intra-group loan, so I know in my heart of hearts that it's actually going to work out a zero balance, it's going to be netted off, but at this particular stage I'm just going to slot it in. I'll deal with the complications a little bit later. As far as current assets are concerned, we take the figure for the parent company, to which we add the figures for the subsidiary. Now notice I've converted the subsidiary's current assets into dollars, just to make life easier for myself. You've got to make sure that you always add dollars together. We then turn our attention to the equity section of our consolidated balance sheets, or statements of financial position. Share capital and share premium are effectively the same thing, so therefore we're going to take the, all of those of the parent and slot them directly onto the face of our SFP. And when it comes to the subsidiary, they both go into working number two. Our default position is we always assume that the subsidiary's share capital and share premium do not change from the date of acquisition. We're also given the reserves of the subsidiary at the SFP date. Notice these are all in crowns. We'll worry about converting them into a different currency at a later date. And we're given, of course, the reserves of the parent company. And at the SFP date, those are 360. So having dealt with all of equity, we turn our attention to liabilities. And in terms of non-current liabilities, add the parent and the subsidiary together. Notice all the time I'm using the closing rate of exchange in respect of the subsidiary and converting into dollars. This is always worth marks in the exam, so make sure that we do this. So we've now dealt with all of the assets and all of the liabilities from our group SFP. 
So what do we see next in the question? Well, we see information in respect of the income statement. So I always set up working number six to do my, my hard work for me to generate all of the key numbers. So notice I've got a column for the parent, a column for the subsidiary. The adjustment column is simply to deal with intra-group elements and then we're going to add this all together. So when it comes to revenue, we take the revenue of the parent company straight from the question itself and as far as the subsidiary is concerned everything is going to be translated using the average rate for the year. So I take 200 for the parent, the subsidiary's figure is 142, divide that by 2 and that gives me a figure of 71. And now for the rest of the income statement all I'm going to do is to slot in the figures for the parent and divide all of the numbers in respect of the subsidiary by 2. Now experience tells me that there might be adjustments to make to both cost of sales and operating costs. So I'm just going to make sure I leave a little bit of extra space in case there's any issues to deal with as far as those elements are concerned. Always leave plenty of space uh, for an income statement. My advice to you is probably to write on every third or fourth line in respect of issues such as cost of sales and distribution and admin expenses or any, for any expenses of that nature. Don't worry about subtotals in this working, so I, I don't expect you to see um, a gross profit figure or an operating profit figure. The only profit that we're particularly interested in is the profit after tax, because some of that profit belongs to the NCI. So for interest receivable, parent and subsidiary, interest payable, parent and subsidiary, it's not very exciting, here, but it is generating for us marks in the exam. Then it comes to tax and I'm going to take the tax of the parent and remember we're going to take 50% of the tax of the subsidiary company. So what we've now done is that we've, we've dealt with all of the key elements of the question in terms of dragging out the main numbers but of course this being a P2 question there's a lot of additional information to have to work our way through. So. We're now going to take a look at goodwill and we see in one of the notes that we've got an impairment of goodwill and that impairment is 2.4 million crowns. Notice that random was acquired 12 months ago so therefore that impairment is also impacting upon this year's income statement. Sorry, let's get my numbers right. Can't, can't tell my numbers. It should be 4.2 uh, because we're working in crowns. So that 4.2 is a reduction in the value of goodwill as far as our crown valuation is concerned. That impairment will also have to be reflected in our income statement. So we go down to the income statement. You could show this as a separate expense if you so desired, or you could add it on to distribution and admin expenses. We're not worried as markers, um, but the thing to remember what to do here is, of course, that we need to convert everything into dollars, and we're going to be translating using the average rate for the year. Now, as far as the goodwill impairment is concerned, although the goodwill impairment relates to the subsidiary, I'm going to put it through the parent column because we're using the proportionate method in terms of uh, our treatment of the NCI and goodwill. If you are using the full value method, put it through the subsidiary column. And this is quite a nerdy point, so don't lose any sleep about it. The most important thing is that you do actually make sure that you reflect the goodwill impairment in the financial statements. And because we've owned the subsidiary for a year, it must all relate to the current income statement. Next, we've got some information in respect of some intragroup sales. Always go back to basics. We know that ultimately in business, cost plus profit equals sales price. We're given information in respect of those key figures, so we need to work out the value of the sales as far as our closing inventories are concerned, because it's only the adjustment in respect of profit in closing inventories. And we're told that profit is 20% on sales price, 
So therefore we can work out the profit which is unrealised from a group point of view. It's 21 hundredths times the 3 million, because remember it's the parent selling to the subsidiary. So therefore we're going to reduce the profits of MIMO, our parent company, by 0.6 and we're going to reduce the group inventories by 0.6 as well. So because we're preparing both a statement of financial position and an income statement, this means we're going to have to put through quite a few adjustments because the profits of MIMO will not only be shown in the group income statement, but of course they will flow through into group reserves as well. So the first thing I'm going to do is going to say, well, because the profits relate to the parent company, I'm going to take out that figure of 0.6 from the parent profits in f as far as group reserves are concerned and cross-reference that to our note. Then we're going to go up to the statement of financial position itself and we're going to deduct 0.6 from our current assets because of course in and every time you put through an adjustment you're thinking debits and credits. Now because it relates to the current year therefore we also have to reflect this adjustment in our closing inventories in cost of sales. Because it's the parent selling to the subsidiary you adjust the books of the parent. So we've therefore dealt with all of the issues, and ultimately this is a uh, this is an F7 adjustment, but we need to give it a twist uh, in, in the sense that we're preparing both the income statement and the SFP. What else do we have to deal with? Well, we've got an issue in the sense that random has paid for the goods and random will have converted the cost of the goods bought from the parent company into crowns because it ultimately that's going to be the functional currency of random. So the cost was six million dollars and at the date of acquisition the exchange rate was two crowns to the dollar so therefore random would have put through the cost of 12 million crowns. A few months later it paid for the goods, but the exchange rate will have moved. Now at the date of payment, the exchange rate was 2.2 crowns to the dollar, so therefore it cost random 13.2 million crowns. So when it puts through that expense, its double entry is to go credit cash 13.2 million crowns, debit payable 12 million, and the balance of 1.2 million is an exchange loss in the books of the parent. Now notice that exchange loss is 1.2 million crowns. But we've got to prepare our consolidated accounts in dollars. So we're going to have to convert that back into dollars using the average rate for the year as far as our income statement is concerned. So let's go back up to the income statement and I'm now going to reflect that impairment loss, sorry, exchange loss. Who's incurred it? Well the subsidiary company has incurred it and it works out as 0.6 million dollars. Remember we're translating everything using the average rate as far as the income statement is concerned. That 0.6 dollars should also be deducted from the reserves of the subsidiary company in working number two. Now we also have to take into consideration the fact that we've got an intra-group loan. The subsidiary has borrowed money from the parent. Fortunately for us, it's at a zero interest rate, so we don't have to net off interest in the income statement. How much did we borrow? Well, it was $5 million. And at the date that the borrowings were made, we have to pick up our exchange rate. So we look at our table for exchange rates, and it was 2.5 crowns to the dollar. So as far as the subsidiary is concerned, it received 12.5 million crowns. But it doesn't owe 12.5 million crowns to the parent, it owes $5 million. 
So at the SFP date, we restate that figure using the closing rate of exchange, which is $2.1, sorry, 2.1 crowns to the dollar, which means that there's been an exchange gain as far as the subsidiary is concerned, because it thought it owed $12.5 million, but it now only owes $2 million. So again, we put through a journal here, we would debit the loan 2 million crowns, and we're going to credit the income statement 2 million crowns. So let's go to the income statement. I'm going to put through here my exchange gain, just doing a little bit of referencing. It's 2 million crowns, but I'm translating everything using the average rate for the year. So 2 million crowns equals an exchange gain of $1 million. That will also have to go through working number two. I'll come back to that in a little while. Um, because anything which impacts upon the profit and loss account of the subsidiary ultimately flows through into group reserves. So here I'm just writing out that journal. It's not, not essential to do that, but we're going to debit the loan 2 million crowns and we're going to credit the income statement with the 2 million crowns. And you will forget items in the exam. I'm always forgetting items uh, to adjust. But I'm now going up to the loan. And the loan is in non-current liabilities. So that's at our exchange gain. And at the year end, that exchange gain or loss is translated using the closing rate because all assets and liabilities are shown using the closing rate. Once you've got the two figures equal, in theory you can now reduce both the loan and non-current liabilities by 5 million. I might leave that to a little bit later or you might choose to do that now. Uh, the choice is very much yours. But disciplined approach, whatever suits you, uh, is to be encouraged. So we've now dealt with around about half of the items in the question. We're making good progress. Remember this is approximately to be 25 to 30 marks in an exam, so you would be looking at around about a 45 minute to 50 minute completion period. As far as marking is concerned, the way that your script will be marked is that you're going to get marks for each item that you deal with correctly. So therefore, make sure that you deal with items on a one-by-one -one basis, bit-by-bit, date-by-date, by date, item by item, and if there's something that you can't do, don't worry about it, because realistically you're not going to get full marks in a P2 question. Just move on to something else which is easier. There's nothing easy in P2, I'm sure everybody who's ever sat the exam will tell you that, but some things are easier than others. So what I'm going to do now is I need to reflect those exchange adjustments in the books of the subsidiary. Remember they've gone from the income statement into profits and profits are part of reserves. So remember we've got an exchange loss of 1.2 million in respect of the purchase of the goods from the parent company and we've got an exchange gain of 2 million crowns in respect of the loan. Having done that, we're now in a position, having dealt with all of the information in the question, to do our standard housekeeping. So the first thing we're going to do here is we're going to add up the net assets total of the subsidiary company at the two key dates. Notice all of these figures are in crowns. Once you've worked out your net assets at acquisition, we're in a position to transfer our attention to working number three, which is our goodwill working. So we take our net assets, we add to that the NCI at acquisition, we're using the proportionate method, so therefore I'm going to take the 132 million from working number two and give the NCI their share, which is of course one quarter, 25%, and then we're going to take away the net assets of the subsidiary at the acquisition date. Again, we generate this figure from working number two above, so I'm going to take away 132 million. So 
So that gives us our total and we take away the impairment which we've already calculated. So therefore our goodwill figure at the SFP date is 16.8 million crowns. I think I might have made a slight mistake there. Let me just do a little bit of checking. Time to get out the calculator again. Sometimes I make the mistake of trying to do figures in my head. Um, but no, no, that seems to be okay. And what I'm now going to do, I'm going to convert my goodwill figure into dollars using the closing rate of exchange. So that works out as $8 million at the SFP date. We're now going to have to do a little bit more work in respect of goodwill. When we acquired the subsidiary, which was at the start of the year, there were 2.5 crowns to the dollar. So therefore we initially recorded the cost as being $48 million. And if you take a look at the statement of financial position, this ties in to the figure that we see in the question itself. But when it comes to the end of the year, we have to restate the cost of the investment using the closing rate of exchange, which is 2.1. So therefore, I'm going to increase the cost of the investment from 48 to $57.1 million. So that's an increase of 9.1. So I'm going to debit cost of investment 9.1 million, and I'm going to credit group reserves 9.1 million as well. So we go down to working number five, and we put that increase in the cost of the investment through to group reserves. This is an increase to the parent, and that is why it's, a, it's reflected in working number five. So every time you put through an adjustment, make sure that you put through both the debit and the credit, and that way your account's always going to balance. So do try to remember to keep your debits and credits dealt with on a regular basis, and this will increase your chances of having figures that balance in your accounts. Now also in respect of goodwill, oh no, no, um, we've got to show the impairment. And how much was the impairment? Well, we're going to take the value as far as crowns is concerned, and we're going to translate that using the closing rate. So the closing rate is 2.1, which means that our dollar value for the goodwill impairment is $2 million. Now, as it's an impairment, it's a deduction. So notice we've got an issue here that the goodwill impairment in the SFP is different to the goodwill impairment that we put through as far as the income statement is concerned. So we've got some key numbers now in respect of goodwill. Still needs a little bit of tidying up. Now, you've actually got a choice here. You can work out the overall exchange gain or loss in respect of goodwill in this working, or you could leave it right to the very end of the question. The choice would be yours. But I try to take a, a fairly consistent approach. And as you can see, at the date of acquisition, goodwill was originally 8.4 million. If we divide through by 2.5, remember our original goodwill figure was 21 million crowns, but using the closing rate of exchange, goodwill has increased from 8.4 to $10 million. Therefore, there's an exchange gain in respect of goodwill of $1.6 million. And because we're using the proportionate method to calculate goodwill, all of that 1.6 million is effectively allocated to the group, 
when we do our exchange gains or losses which appear in OCI. So I'm going to go down here to OCI and there's nothing wrong with combining all of your exchange gains and losses. The only reason why I've separated them out in this particular answer is just to highlight the fact that there's more than one of them. So Goodwill has increased in the year in dollar terms by 1.6 million and all of that is borne by or is rewarded to the parent company. If we'd been using the full value method you would have split that gain between the parent and the NCI. We're now in a position to calculate the NCI. We've already worked out the figure at acquisition and notice I'm going to do my NCI figures in crowns and then I'm going to worry about converting them into dollars uh, right at the very end. So we've already shown in our goodwill calculation in working number three that the NCI was 33 million crowns. We're then going to give the NCI their share which is 25% of our post acquisition profits. Remember we pick up our post acquisition profits by going back to working number two and those post acquisition profits were 15.8 million crowns. It's very important in questions to ensure that you operate in a consistent currency. So 25% I'm going to work to the nearest one decimal place so I'm going to say that that's uh, 4 million dead gives me 50, sorry, 37 million crowns divide that using the closing rate of exchange so that gives me an NCI total of 17.6 million dollars. Up to the face of our SFP and slot in 17.6 million dollars and show your source as well. Having dealt with working number four we also have to deal with working number five which is group reserves. Notice as always I try to be as methodical as I can be when dealing with these questions and if we're going to give 25% of the profits to the NCI we're going to give the other 75% of the parent but notice we need to show these in dollars so I'm going to take the 15.8 million crowns of post acquisition profit give 75% of that to the parent and then convert that into dollars using the closing rate of exchange so let's just plug that into a calculator and that gives us a figure of 5.6. We can therefore add up our group reserves total. I've got here a figure of 372.1. Back up to our group SFP and we've now got our total. I'm now going to do the housekeeping as far as my group SFP is concerned. In the exam I probably wouldn't bother to put in the overall total as far as my statement of financial position is concerned but I do think it is good practice to work out individual totals. Remember we've got to reduce the intra-group element of the loan so I'm going to take 5 million off non-current liabilities and 5 million off my loan asset and now the moment of truth let's add up and we've got 777.5 on the bottom half if you do do some rounding errors and you're out by 0.1 don't go back and adjust the figures it's not important they're, they're very sympathetic the ACCA markers so we put in P PPE we don't have an intergroup loan as far as our consolidated financial statements are concerned current assets total and hallelujah that adds up to 777.5 but we're still not finished because of course we still have our group income statement to deal with and what we can do here is we can start to slot in some numbers from our financial statements from our working number five notice I'm, I'm not getting worked up 
even though I've got headings for gross profit and profit from operations, I don't tend to stick those figures into my answer unless I've got spare time in the exam. All I'm going to do is to take the individual expense and income totals from working number six and slot them onto the face of my answer. Having put through those, that gives us a profit for the year of $39.2 million. We, get, we need to split that between the NCI and the parent. So remember we need to give the NCI a share of the profits of the subsidiary only. And their share is 25%. So let's go down to working number six. And we need to work out the profits of the subsidiary having put through all of our adjustments. We don't need to work out the profit for the parent company because that all goes to the shareholders of the parent. So I've got here a figure of 7.9 having put through my adjustments. Let me just check, I think I might have calculated that incorrectly. Sometimes I do make calculator errors. Um, let me do, I'm, I'm not quite certain what's happening here. Might have changed that to 9.7. So as far as the NCI is concerned, we're going to give them 25% of the profits of the subsidiary company. So if the NCI are given 25% of the 9.7, we give the remainder of the group profit to the shareholders of the parent. So all I'm going to do is I'm going to take away the figure of 2.4 from my group profit for the year. Oops, oh sorry, that should have been 7.9. Sorry, it should be 25% of 7.9, not 25% of 9.7, a couple of figures muddled up. So we give the shareholders of the parent all of the profits for the group for the year of the 39.2 less the amount that we've allocated to the NCI of 2 million and that's how we allocate the full 39.2 million is there anything left well we still have to work out the exchange gain or loss in respect of the assets of the subsidiary for the year. So whilst you'd have earned uh, an awful lot of marks if you've done the work to date, one final nerdy little tweak, we need to work out our group exchange movement. And the way that we do that is that we take first of all the movement on the opening net assets. Remember our opening net assets is the opening share capital and equity. Because we've owned this subsidiary for a year it means the acquisition date was also the date of the opening net assets. So we can pick up our opening net assets total as far as our crowns figure is concerned from working number two. So let's just pop up to working number two and as you can see at the start of the year we had 132 million crowns. And what we're now going to do, we're going to translate that figure using both the closing and the opening rate of exchange. So at the closing rate, and remember the closing rate is 2.1, it means that we've got 62.9 million dollars worth of assets but a year ago when we made the acquisition that figure was 52.8 so can you see that the value of the net assets of the subsidiary have increased by 10.1 million so that is an exchange gain but we've also made profits in the year now remember the profits in the year are translated using the average rate as far as the income statement but everything is translated using the closing rate as far as our SFP is concerned. So our profit for the year 
as far as the subsidiary is concerned, is 7.9 million crowns. What I'm going to do is I'm going to translate that 7.9 million crowns using both the closing and the average rate. So at the closing rate, it means that we've got... Oh, hold it, I think that's wrong. Let me just recheck. Oh, sorry, it's not 7.9 million crowns, is it? Because that's 7.9 million dollars. So I, I need to convert my profit for the year into dollars. Now in the income statement, everything's been translated using two dollars or two crowns to the dollar. So my profit for the year is in fact 15.8 million crowns. So at the closing rate of 2.1, that gives me a figure of $7.5 million. How did I translate the profits in the group income statement? I used the average rate for the year. And we've already known that that's $7.9 million. So can you see that we've actually made an exchange loss? Because when we come to our SFP date, profits are lower at 7.9, 7.5 million than they were in the income statement. So this gives us an overall exchange gain of $9.7 million. And we're going to allocate that $9.7 million between the group and the NCI on the basis of the shares owned by each party. And that exchange gain is shown in OCI. So we go up to our income statement. And you could have combined this with the exchange gain on the goodwill. I'm just trying to separate the figures out into separate elements. So our exchange gain on net assets and the profits for the year is shown in other comprehensive income. How much goes to the NCI? Well, they've got 25% of the subsidiary, so we're going to give them 25% of that figure of 9.7 million. So 2.4 million to the NCI and 7.3 million, which is the balancing figure, or the other 75% goes to the group. So that gives us a total figure, as far as OCI, OCI gains are concerned, of 11.3 million. Now, strictly, we should be putting uh, an OCI balance uh, into group reserves. We should be split, but that'll be the least of the problems I'll be worrying about in the exam. So that is how to deal with a consolidated statement of financial position and income statement with currencies.